I try to make this a simplify thing. I think it's necessary to explain how we should read certain things when you know you do have an understanding of the Godhead who is the Creator and when other passages of Scripture uses certain words that makes it sound like Jesus is the Creator. Keep in mind the King James Version was translated from the Greeks and they're all Trinitarians. So they select and they use words that will seek to carry out their point. Even when you come to certain words that directly wouldn't use a certain word like create, I've noticed in the chain reference, they will always go back to St. John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the word. Now, I think for a little bit tonight, it would be good for us to look at these. Try to imagine, supposing Paul was in our day and knowing how he believed, do you think he would use these same words that we read here? You wouldn't be reading it that way at all. He would be using words that would always carry out the objective, what the proper noun is, to where the noun lays. And we, we, we would be reading a different Bible. So I'm not saying tonight that we re rewrite the Bible, but if we could have an understanding by revelation what we're reading. Learn how to read it. You cannot have two creators. Let's establish that. You cannot have two creators. You could have one master creator. Then the word creation can be used in a secondary sense. But that is pointing to redemption. Because it's not speaking of creation in the original text. It's talking about recreating. That's why them six days in Genesis, they are not the original creation. They are the recreating process that was used to bring it out of this chaotic state that it was in when darkness was found upon the deep and the earth was found void. When it was void, without form and so forth and darkness upon the deep, that lets you know the planet itself had been there already from some previous existence. That points back to the original creation. And who was that creator? It was none other than God himself. And nowhere else can you use any other object or noun to take it away from that. You've got to keep it consistent all the way through. So tonight, just bear with me, because we can establish these proper reading in our minds. That will help us to know how to read it and really what then we are to get out of it. I'm going to pick, <clears throat> pick it up here again tonight in its full text. Giving thanks unto the Father. Well, we know the Father is God himself. Which hath made us. But I like to think that this. Who hath created or ordained us to be partakers. of the inheritance of the saints in light. Well, light is truth. In this sense, when we read the word light, we cannot associate it with any other thing other than truth. 
Because if we can see truth as the, the final means by how we are introduced to something that we are to benefit by, it helps us to know how to read certain words. Who, it's the Father who is the who, had delivered us from the power of darkness. Well, again, it's not talking about solar darkness. It's talking about the darkness we many times live in. Born in this world, in an era of so-called Christendom, and look at the many beliefs of Christendom. No wonder modern uh, professor intellectualism attacks Christendom today. We can't have confidence in any of you. You're all at one another's throat. You all say one thing, believe something else. You can't, you can't agree. Well, you know and I know, brothers and sisters, the first century of Christendom was not that way. But yet here in our era of time, oh, yes, but this is the infallible Word of God. They're ready to say that. But then when you begin to compare what they say, what they believe, along with somebody else of equal status, well, but you see, and here we go again, down a trail of darkness. But as we move on here, and have translated us, that's you and me, into the kingdom of his dear son. Now, God had a reason to do this work by this means. And let's look at it in this way. Whatever God created, he knew long before there was the beginning even of the molecule or anything, why he was going to do it a certain way. That's why writers would say, that you and I were chosen in Christ. Now it's not the person Christ that did the choosing. It's God the Father who is the life giver and the creator. But he wanted to do this by a certain means. <coughs> because God knew that it would take some kind of a price and some means to atone for the wrong that man would be guilty of doing. So, he's translated us and brought us into the kingdom of his dear son. In whom we have, in whom, now notice, it's in him er, or through him. We have redemption. Reclaimed. Redemption is to redeem something or another, we will say, that has been rendered of little value, but we've been, we've been redeemed by a means. So, it's through the blood of Jesus Christ. Even, in, even the forgiveness of sins. When we come to the 15th verse, <clears throat> now it's speaking of the person of Jesus himself, who is the image of the invisible God. Now, I'm not going to repeat what I said this morning, but since the, the writer, which is Paul, wrote it like this, let's imagine ourselves. God ordained that when he brought his only begotten son into the world to be a visible means by how and through he himself could be seen, not as a tangible object, but in the manifestation of all of his qualities, his attributes, of his love, his power, what he's capable and able to do for you and me. This is the way the thought carries us. Jesus then was born begotten, brought forth, grew up. And if we can just see him in the right vision of faith. He was God's role model to you and me. That's the best I can explain it. How many times we read in the history of certain generals, leaders, kings and such, or even in the Bible, David, the feats that they conquered, they achieved, how they lead their people, how the men stood around loyal and faithful. And centuries later, other little boys or children can want to copy something about their life in their actions just like that. 
It's utterly impossible to look, to make our physical self look just exactly like that person. But if we can just grasp and understand how they walked, not necessarily how the physical, but it means how they proceeded down the pathway of life, what motivated them, how did they act when they was under pressure, how did they treat their fellow man, how they was willing to go the last mile for some people, never selfish, never greedy, always willing to share themselves with somebody to help the other person. We can absolutely go into the category of words trying to express Jesus as a role model for you and me. We would exhaust our vocabulary to try to do so. Because what one person would see and imagine, someone else would see something else. That's why the four Gospels are more or less, they use the same words. Some of them re re uh, copy the same things that, that the other one did. Others didn't. Others go back and reach and bring something else in. It's just the way it struck that person. But my main point is, Jesus was ordained by God, set forth by God, and he lived a life, he demonstrated God in all his characteristics and such. That is, it was God's purpose that he become a role model. Then when we turn to other scriptures, and where Paul would say, that we are to be created in the image of Christ. If Christ was in the image of God, then how is it possible then that we can bear the image of Christ? Does it mean that we try to walk physically or look physically in that image? That's not the image at all. But we try to see him then as the true role model and we try to apply some of it to our life. And it's a sad thing, brothers and sisters, what we see today. I was talking to a person by phone the other day, and they're talking about in many churches, and this is the ecumenical spirit. In many nominal churches over the country, in Canada and around the world, youth today are being stimulated by, it. we will say, a so-called revelation of Jesus in their midst. And brothers and sisters, the role model I see is enough to make you want to pull your hair out. They don't see Jesus of the Bible as a role model at all. He's an invisible being, and they're left to choose whatever kind of an image they want to portray. And that's why it doesn't matter what color hair they got. They got one day one thing and something else. And young men, to think of it that are to grow up one day to be a, a, a daddy to a little baby, and here he's got a nose ring in his nose, in his ears. Brothers and sisters, in the South Sea Islands, I saw natives on them islands that looked better than some of these educated white characters we've got to walk in the streets of America. Now that's the truth. Those people do those things because sometimes it's tribal markings. It gives them an identity from a somebody in another tribe. And that's the way they've done it for centuries. But when you see America drifting in the manner it's done, I have to say, I don't care how many times they repeat the word Jesus or hallelujah, if they want to portray that physical body that God created in his image and likeness after him, then I have to say, brothers and sisters, something's wrong somewhere. They've lost sight of Jesus of the Bible. And he's become a counterfeit to modern society. Now with this in mind, when we come to the 16th verse, let's look at this very carefully. For by him, were all things created. Now that's talking about the person of Christ. When you know now, if you just take that for face value, 
That's why your Trinitarians can say, Jesus is the Word, He's the Creator. See there, that's what it says. And they could read Ephesians 3, 9 and never see a thing. Because that's the way it was translated by him, by the same, we will say, translators. But when we're looking here in this 15th verse, in the 16th verse, keep in mind, it's the writer who is Paul, seeking to convey to the believer that it is through him, it is through the object of Christ being the means of redemption. Something has happened to you and me. So it's through him were all things created. Now then, that takes us back before the foundation of the world. And here's what we're looking at. When God created the earth in the beginning, when Jesus as a visible person was not yet even in the picture, only was in the mind of God. However many of you, however many of you, millions of years went by, Jesus was nowhere around. But whatever took place on the planet Earth, how long it lasted after this iniquity was set in, cannibalism, the killing, the bloodshed, the Earth became stained with the blood, the dead bodies of the animal kingdom of that hour. God knew that that would be that way. But there's no worse written did he plan a, a redemption for that particular hour of beings. He let it go on until it has fully been a means to test his angelic beings. Therefore, <clears throat> when we pick up how Paul would write about Christ, how that God in Christ foreordained before the foundation of the world, and that's when you and I were chosen. Before the earth had this beginning, we were already foreordained. That's the foreknowledge of God. <clears throat> if we're foreordained, then we have to realize God knew. Before this was a fact, He already knew what was going to go on, down, through time. What we have up here is three circles. When we complete our picture, the point is this. God does things in threes. There's justification, there's sanctification, and the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It's just how God glorifies your inner being with the presence of himself. And that little essence of himself in your life and my life now is what causes the body then to take on, at the end of this, this journey, immortality. It's God glorifying his redemptive work that he has invested in you and me. So when we read here these words, let's try to convey a thought to ourselves from the writer, because keep on in mind, if Paul was rewriting this same letter, I'm sure you would not be reading the words that we are. If he was to write it in English, he would be expressing it in English that's good and clear. Because otherwise, teachers that know English would look at you and say, is that the best you can do? <laughs> Tell me you understand my point. <clears throat> Paul, the original writer, whatever language text he used, he was always using words that differentiated from one thought to another. But yet he would use words that link, that bridge the gap, so that, that our thoughts and understanding is always running consistently. So through our by is how many times we have to put the word in there ourselves to make the thought that we're reading be in line with the revelation that we have about what the noun is. Is it God the Father or is it God the Son? That is the object standing out. <clears throat> that are in heaven and that are on earth. So whatever there is, brothers and sisters, God knew that there would be a day. And that's this earth now, ever since Adam was placed in the Garden of Eden. Everything that's on the earth. Even the fact that God placed a little bit of heaven in Eden, that was the beginning. 
God designed the earth and everything. That when the hour would come, that there would need to be a redeemer. We can say that it was for the redeemer's sake he designed certain things to go a certain way. Because that's the means by how he was going to reconcile it, bring it back to himself. So that's why, brothers and sisters, we are living in the hour when the earth is the object on which redemption is applicable to fallen mankind. But we know this. When this about man is over, then for that millennium era, brothers and sisters, when the devil is bound, and there's only righteous people here living with him, ruling and reigning, there's going to be certain things committed unto the Son that this earth will begin to bear the effects of it. And when we look at that, we have to understand then why that certain things was foreordained by God. But it was through him, meaning Jesus, or for him, that things was done a certain way. Otherwise, we would, re be re we would be reading about secondary creators, and our thoughts would be going con completely different from, from something else. Whether they be thrones, or dominions, or principalities, our powers, all things were created by him and for him. But you know and I know, the word created there does not mean that Jesus then is the creator. It's redeemed by him. And we're going to find out as we finish this message, whatever that is. The era of redemption is the recreating process, not the initial creating. Otherwise, what did Paul have mean when he said, you're a new creature? Is he actually saying, you're just a newborn babe? In the new birth sense, yes. But in the physical sense, no. You're a part of the old creative law. But you and I have inherited sin. There's no way that we can enter the kingdom of God. Still partakers of that inherited sin in nature. So we have to see that redemption is a means that God, through Christ, pays the price to bring us out, purchase us back, that he can recreate us a new creature. It don't mean that we've got to be born by the womb again, but it means, brothers and sisters, there's got to be a complete new life. Transform. So that's, we, we could say, it's regeneration, it's redemption, it's recreating, making a new person out of us. That's the way we have to read these scriptures. Once you know, brothers and sisters, the main object, the creator himself, then when we read these other verses, the translators have used and tried to keep the Trinity thought in, in focus. We're not reading about our Trinity. We're trying to keep the word separate so that our thought is always consistent. So he did not create a thing, but it's through him that things were created and for him. And verse 17, and he, meaning Christ, is before all things. And brothers and sisters, he did not exist before all things. He was only in the mind of God before all things. But before all things, certain things was going to be Therefore, it was chosen to be that way in him. Because he would be the means for how redemption and that object could be reconciled back to God through and by him. <clears throat> and verse 18, and he is the head of the body. Now when, here is the final objective. This is why, brothers and sisters, when the same Paul that wrote, all we're reading about tonight, when he wrote in 1 Corinthians 11, how that God is the head of Christ. That means this, God's still the head of the universe. He is. And Christ is only the head of that which is being redeemed by and through Christ back to God the Father. That's the way we have to read it. 
So therefore, as he is the head of the body, which is the church, who is the beginning from the firstborn, from the dead. Down here, brothers and sisters, in the 15th verse, verse, he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every newborn creature that's ever going to be. That's the way we can read that. Because Christ is the image of what God wanted all other creatures to be like. Conform to that. That's why we're translated into a kingdom. It's not like the kingdom of the world. So he's the firstborn of the family. And he's the firstborn from the dead. This makes Christ then the beginning of the creation of God. Let's turn to Revelations. <clears throat> when we can begin to see these scriptures that the same man who is Paul and we catch his thought and then try to keep his thought consistent always running parallel with other things that comes alongside here we see in the Laodicean church age and that's the age that you and I are living in we're living in the Laodicean age, chapter 3, verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of Laodicea, write these things, saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness. That's exactly what Christ was. He was faithful before mankind. He was faithful to God in all things he was required to do and be. And since he was the true witness, he left a testimony, brothers and sisters, that we can say, he's my example. Yes, the beginning of the creation of God. Notice how that's worded. The beginning. But that's not pointing to here. Let's read it right. Jesus knew he was not the beginning of that at all. He knew he's the beginning of the new creation, which is brought about by redemption. Now, if he's the beginning of the new creation, which all takes place in here, there comes a time when that's accomplished itself, it's fulfilled. What will he be then when that is fulfilled? He's the ending. For whatever he was in the beginning to obtain a certain object, God knows exactly how much or how many or who all is going to be partakers of that. There's an ending to it. We'll find that in 1 Corinthians, in the 15th chapter. The same writer who wrote what about back in Colossians, in the 15th chapter, it tells us. And I've got the scriptures written up here. Right there it is. For he will rule and reign. <clears throat> that's the millennium. First off, brothers and sisters, there is a spiritual reign that's brought about through his mediatorial high priest work. But when he comes, brothers and sisters, to be king of all the earth and lord of all the earth, you know and I know, he will only be a king on this earth for a certain period of time, a thousand years. When that's done, Everything that this earth is to benefit by having been subject to his redemptive kingship. It will reach that finished point. When it does, when you read that 15th chapter, you will see how that in <clears throat> Adam all die, but in Christ shall all be made alive, whether saint or sinner. First, the righteous are raised to dwell before him and with him in an immortality. But then there comes a second resurrection which has no life in it at all. That's to get out of hell, the wicked spirits. That's to take out of the ground the dead bodies. And that all that wickedness and evil is to be cast into the lake of fire. What does that do? It rids from this planet earth the very traces of sin and death. And Paul explained it so vividly. 
for he must reign until he's established and put out all divine order, law, and authority and power. And the last enemy will be death itself. Where did he get this? It's the Father that invested him the power to accomplish it. So when we're talking about creation, we're talking about redemptive creation, renewing something, making it all over again. Yet he never changed the molecules, the atoms, or anything. But he's changed the effect that caused, we will say, sin to me, and the planet Earth bearing the marks and stains of it. And then when the last enemy itself, which is death itself, has been accomplished through Christ, what does it say? Then the kingdom that God has been in the process through these 7,000 years of time, creating a family of mankind, some went the wrong way and some went the right way. When that era is over, there will be the righteous people. They will be in different categories, but they'll all be righteous. And they will all be Im immortal. And then, brothers and sisters, when there's no more spirits in hell, in the heart of the earth, and there's no more graves that houses the dead bodies, there's no more traces in the animal kingdom of how Satan has warped and twisted their natures. Everything then that's on the planet is peaceful, harmonious. Redemption. In other words, here's the ending of the new creation. And now then, the planet Earth, and since heaven itself is going to be new, why? Because it means the dirty devil and all his demons are not going to be allowed to proliferate around out there. What does the Bible say? We wrestle not against flesh and blood, against principalities and powers in high places. There is a certain atmosphere around this planet Earth. Every devil just runs out there, brothers and sisters. He's having a big time. But when you come to the book of Revelation, it plainly tells you, and Michael and his angels fought, and the devil, or the dragon and his angels fought. And the dragon lost the combat. So that means everything that's invisible, you and I can't see, is going to be conquered. And them dirty devils are going to be chained down. And then, brothers and sisters, as John saw a new heaven and a new earth, it's not a new planet. The planet itself is millions of years old. But brothers and sisters, by the time it has gone through a thousand years of millennium reign, in the eyes of God, it's a beautiful place. And I have to say tonight, <clears throat> what does that make Christ then become? When you read 1 Corinthians 15, then it says, and the Son is subject to him that put all things under his authority, invested in him the Godhead, all of his redemptive attributes to accomplish this. And time itself brought about the necessity for the expression of these things. And what it's accomplished, at the end of that millennium, there's going to be a perfect kingdom. So brothers and sisters, I hope you understand what my explanation is. If the Apostle Paul was here in our day, and he was writing the original scriptures in English, you would read these texts altogether different than what you do in the King James. But see, we can't bring them back. We just have to ask God, give us the right thought. Let us see the right results that we can obtain the right understanding. Now I want to get back to a, a basic point. <clears throat> Every time I touch on the Godhead, somewhere from overseas, these, some of these old Pentecostal oneness, Jesus name, they'll write back a little thought, Brother Jackson, you make Jesus just, just like you and me. Well, that's a lie. How can I make Jesus just like you and me? 
They turn around and around. They make him just a robot. It's only the flesh is the sun. But the life itself that causes him to breathe, that causes him to speak, that causes him to look where to go, to him, that's God. They cannot differentiate and separate. Then I have to say, brothers and sisters, when that one which is called the Son of God, which is going to be my elder brother, in the millennium reign, I'm not going to be uh, walking up to him and say, good morning, Mr. Rod. Now, that's the best way I can describe what I'm trying to convey. As I've said this way many times, he is your brother will never be your heavenly father. But he who is your heavenly father will never be your brother. But he who is your perfect brother without sin, your heavenly father dwelt in him. He dwelt in him in the fullness of all of his saving attributes. But that same being, a spirit, wants to live and dwell in you and me also in a measure. And it's going to be that way, brothers and sisters, until this whole redemptive thing is over. And when we have been physically changed and glorified, and the kingdom have become complete, that's the people, that's the earth, then the whole thing is going to be delivered back up to God the Father, that he might have preeminence in the whole thing. Jesus then is seen by the family of God as your elder brother. The one and only means by how God reconciled you and me back to himself. None of us can ever exalt ourselves above that brother. But he will see to us, brother, see to it that we recognize him as the only means. How we could ever attain this, being reconciled back to God. To me, it's a beautiful picture. It's not how God became a man himself. It's how God became in a man. And that's why, brothers and sisters, all the New Testament epistles written by Paul or Peter or James, they all address this picture, God the Father and the Son. They all dressed it in the same manner. They give recognition to the Father, they give recognition to the Son. And you don't find them, brothers and sisters, preaching that the flesh is the Son, but the life itself was God. To me, that, that's just as negative as being a Trinitarian. So tonight, my brothers and sisters, <clears throat> when we begin to see the fact as we are living in these closing days of time, I'm thankful that he has allowed us to see something that puts the Bible, the scriptures, back in a setting of, of a truth. And to think he's brought us out of different things, and he's brought us out of of darkness. Not only has he brought us out of the darkness of sin and unbelief, but think of the things, brothers and sisters, he's removed from your mind. You went to this church, some went to that church, some went here and some went there. They had these old traditional concepts because a lot of it was just handed down by the parents, the grandparents, and the system. And we took for granted many things that we heard when we was a child. And so we become so traditionally bound and motivated in life. We just believe what the older ones before us said. But we've come to an hour, brothers and sisters. We've got to be willing to lay down all this dark rubbish. That's why I said this morning, tradition is a curse. It's a fact. You are born a human being created by God to believe something. And I have to say it's a tragedy when some people don't believe nothing. That's worse than darkness. I have to say that's out of the pit. <laughs> that is darkness. There's no, there, there's no hope in that. And the, and the thought came to me the other night. What is education? When you go to school to obtain an education, what is, what, what is the main thing you learn? You learn the basics. First, how to obtain, take responsibility of yourself. 
Because sooner or later, brothers and sisters, you'll not always have the ones that's caring for you with you. Even when we're young, there are certain things you begin to learn. When you, do, when you begin to learn, you begin to pick up those basic fundamental things that's important for your personal existence, your functioning, your living, how you conduct yourself. It involves character. It involves manners. It involves principles. It involves many things that you will do, how you take care of yourself, so that you can health-wise benefit. Just think, brothers and sisters, I hope to goodness you don't think you go to school to get an education how you can play basketball better. What's basketball going to do to help you learn how to eat at the table? Let's be sensible. All this sports stuff, brothers and sisters, to me is not education. Because it don't teach you one earth at a time how to make an honest dollar. And take responsibility of you providing for your own existence in this earth. But a lot of the young people today are left the thought. It's either government's going to be responsible for their future livelihood. That the government is responsible, how they exist. Then they're taking away, brothers and sisters, their own responsibility. How they to provide themselves. And what I got to thinking about, what is these basics? They're all detrimental. They're important. How we really are able to carry on a communication with people. Because if you know the basic function, brothers and sisters, how other things fluctuate, or happen. You can't communicate with them on them things. If you've never seen a farmer plow a field, cultivate something or another, how can you relate to him or by him what he's doing to someone else? You can't. But think of the parables that Jesus spoke. Was Jesus a farmer? No. But thinks every time he left Nazareth to go to Jerusalem, there's a long route of roads that pass through the countryside. He's watched the sheep herders. He's watched the farmers sow their seed. He's watched them when they reaped it. So part of these things, we will say, was incorporated into his learning. And he took these things that he learned and passed them on to people. And he illustrated his basic thought by using that as a means. That's why, brothers and sisters, many times you can learn a lot in life by watching how other, other people do things. Always watch the man that succeeds in what he's doing. Don't try to tell him how to do it. <laughs> but when people begin to learn and watch other people that are successive, successful, I mean, and they achieve things, you don't have to many times ask them a million questions, just watch them and take things to thought, to thought. So to educate yourself in life is to learn the basics, how to live and exist, to communicate, to be a part of society, to provide for your own existence. And you can achieve. If that's what our responsibility in the natural way, then transfer that to your spiritual life. You've got to learn something. That's why the scripture says we grow by grace in the knowledge. And that don't mean going to Sunday school or to seminary, learning a lot of Greek and Hebrew. It's when we begin to see an exampleship, something to apply to our own personal life. And it's how brothers and sisters many times we can understand the deep things of God and yet they're so simple. And when you get to talk about it with your brothers and sisters, others who don't have a picture of nothing, they listen at you, but that's over my head. I grant you, brothers and sisters, when I heard Brother Branham, yes, there were some things over my head. And I said to myself, first off, I accepted, that's man, that's God's man for the hour. I'm going to learn something. So learn, I purposed, I was going to humble myself and accept the fact he's going to teach me something. If I watch him, listen to him, 
and not get in front of him, we can all learn. And that brings me to the point, brothers and sisters, when I made mention this morning of what this brother has done out in, there, uh, out in New Mexico. Two years ago when we was out there, he had a band, I believe it was, and he was wanting to come to the meeting, and it was getting cold and such. In prayer, God spoke to him how to find, how to get the heater, the fan to run. Because somehow or other, underneath of the body of the, the van, there was two wires. And he found them when he connected them together, the fan run. Now, if God thought enough about a man that was wanting to come to the meeting, that he told him exactly how to get the, the heater to run, then after he got to the meeting, it seemed like he became enthused about what he heard. So he makes preparation to move his family from Chaparral to Phoenix to be with Brother Cecil. And look, it just lasts about a year. And I have to say, brothers and sisters, there are some people born in this life to always want to be in front of somebody else. They are never willing to take a back seat, middle ways, or anything. If they can't be up here in the front or something or other, they sure ain't going to be a part of that. But I have to say, now when the man said that, that the, the, this vision or whatever it was, says to him that this was not for the bride of Christ, this is for the Jews. I told the brother I was talking to, I said, does not he realize the whole letter of Revelation is a prophecy? It's not one or two verses is the prophecy, and the rest is instructions that deals with history and stuff. It's a prophecy from beginning to end. And it was not given to the Jewish nation, it was given to the Gentile bride church to be carried down through time to the end when it would be open and the bride would understand. Because the bride's going to be here, brothers and sisters, when everything that God does for the Jewish nation, they're going to be able to sit with their own eyes. Let me say this to you tonight. If you as a person that are to be part of the bride of Christ that's to be raptured one of these days, if you keep your health and your heart keeps beating and God allows you to live to the day that the rapture does take place, you are going to see the Jewish temple in the process of being rebuilt. Don't tell me you're not going to be enthused. Don't tell me you're not going to be interested. You are. Because that Middle East is going to be turned upside down. And the Pope's not going to do it. No, the Pope will try to stick his cents worth in between now and then. Try to get things to go his way. But it's got to go the Bible way. Sure, he will have his hour. But his hour will only come when it's absolutely placed in the Scriptures the way it is. Like I've said to different ones, as I'm talking to the lady in Israel, Plus to the sitter in Canada that sent some of the tapes over there. I said there's so many prophecies in the Old Testament that culminate in the New in the book of Revelation. Look for instance, Zechariah chapter 4. When you see the two anointed olive trees and the candlesticks. That's symbols, but it's prophecy. If you only had that, who would know that's, what, that's pointing to two men? No way. You come to Matthew, the 17th chapter, Jesus told the multitude one day, there's some standing here that shall not taste of death till they've seen the, power, the Son of Man coming in the power and the glory of his kingdom. Six days later, he took with them Peter, James, and John, went up into a high mountain. He was transfigured right before their very eyes. They were able to see Jesus coming in his glorious attire anointing as he comes in the 19th chapter. But the fact that these two prophets, Moses and Elijah of old, appeared to him in the same vision, that was a sign that them prophets would precede his visible return. So then when we do come to the book of Revelation, it's in the 11th chapter, that it takes the wraps off of it. And here you see the anointing, who the two anointed olive trees and candlesticks are.
That's why I've said, in them tapes, when the Jews think they can just be saved on the basis of the Old Testament, even the Torah, forget it. It don't constitute the whole redemptive message. So, so it is in this hour. And I have to believe, brothers and sisters, there's a Gentile people that today, they know that God sent a man and his name was William Marion Branham. And I thank God for it. The denominations hates it. They talk about the gift that was in the man, yes. But there's other things that the man taught. And I'm thankful to God for it. Because it helps us, brothers and sisters, to know how to study this Bible, not spoken word books. Imagine if the disciples in the days of Christ that had heard him and walked with him, if they would have went on down the road of life after his departure, and Jesus said this, and Jesus said that, and Jesus said that, and the Master said this, and the Master said that, you'd be reading about it. How many times do you ever even see him talking like that? But they took the same thought, and God the Holy Ghost added it. To keep on feeding the thought and the revelation, and I have to say, we're living in that day. We are up the road further than we were in 1965. You never heard Brother Branham ever say there's going to be a terrible war in the Middle East that's going to rock this world. He never lost, left that kind of thought. More and more he would say, the rapture's just ahead. Look how he taught the last night he spoke on the seventh seal. His expressions was to leave the thought. We are so close to the imminent coming of Christ. We don't know when it could be, but it could just happen any moment. Here we've come 35 years. And some that hurt him then, they're in the ground now. Some have gotten older. But I'm thankful to God that he absolutely opened my eyes to the reality. You cannot sit down in 1965 and rehearse and keep looking back. You're not going to grow by doing things like that. And you're not going to please God by acting like that either. Because the disciples in the days of Jesus didn't do that. So it's not how many times you, uh, you repeat the prophet. It's what you heard him say and how you apply it to your heart and to your own understanding. How it causes you to live. How it causes you to look to his written word. Because to many that lived in 1965 and heard Brother Adam say what he did, they haven't seen another thing in the Bible since then. Because it's a closed book. He said everything that's necessary to get us out of here. And I have to say, you're going to be fooled one of these days. There's a lot of things taking place. And I'm thankful to the Lord for it. So tonight, brothers and sisters, this little message that I brought today might not seem to be important. But I do want to leave one little, little more thought with you. When that millennium time comes, Jesus and his glorified saints, the church, is going to rule and reign with him. There are people out here in the denominational world tonight. They are the foolish virgins. They're caught up in this charismatic spirit. They've got testimonies of what all is going, going on. I'm not saying anything to take anything away from them. I'm just thankful that they are a foolish virgin and that God has a place for them. But I'm thankful, brothers and sisters, that God has let us see something in His Word. Like I keep saying, as the hour for the week of Daniel to come, that comes close to us, there's something among the Gentile bride people that's going to establish a bridge, a link of communication. And it won't be, it won't be about the stock market. And it won't be about things in the natural. There's going to be an element of Gentile people that will be able to talk freely on the same revelatory basis. Because it's in the book of Revelation that speaks specifically 
that Israel is going to have two prophets come to them. It's them prophets that's finally going to take, and with the revelation that they bring, it's going to lift the anointing. I mean, the, uh, the veil of carnality, unbelief tradition. And God's going to cause many of them to see the fact Jesus was the Messiah. Blindness in part has happened unto them till the fullness of the Gentiles be brought in. And I'm thankful, brothers and sisters, that we are privileged to be able to see a few of these things as we get closer to that time. How much will our part play in it? It's immaterial to me. But I'm thankful that God somehow or other has left, let something or other that we believe fall into their hands. And they, they, they've said again, they said it to the sister in Canada, keep those tapes coming because they mean so much to us. And so that lets me know, brothers and sisters, if we will live right as a church, a body of people, it ain't because I know anything, it ain't because I am, am something. I'm just a, just a sinner saved by grace. If I would have known this 40 or 50 years ago, brothers and sisters, I don't know where I'd be. But I have, I'm thankful as I look back that God seen fit to take this old ignorant kid and let me begin to study this book. And I'll say tonight, as much as Brother Branham preached on serpent seed, what he said it was in the Garden of Eden, there's a lot of people, brothers and sisters, are there as ignorant about the tree of life, what it was and what it wasn't. But I'll have to say, brothers and sisters, it's after God took the man off of the scene that he used this no-good-for-nothing farmer kid to give, me, give him a picture of really what happened and what the two trees was. Upstairs is a Bible. It's a large Schofield. Brother Nelson down from near Evansville, he brought it here two weeks ago Sunday. He had bought it from a certain place. But he looked, <clears throat> and it didn't have the large print like he liked it. So he gave it to the church to let somebody have it. But he said, in there is a little, little pamphlet. It's on serpent seed. It's put out down in that area somewhere by this preacher tells his name. He's one of them apostolic Jesus name characters. And he attacks Brother Branham on serpent seed. And some of the explanations he has. He went into the garden and he said, all these trees grew out of the ground. Even the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. And I thought to myself, boy, you missed it there. People, the tree of knowledge did not grow out of the ground. Read it right. Neither did the tree of life grow out of the ground. Read it right. Because the tree of life isn't even in the ground today. You know where it's at? It's in the paradise of God. You read that, brothers and sisters, in the book of Revelation. He said the word eat means eat. That's not so. Because in the book of Revelation, when he's speaking to the first church age, which is Ephesus, to him that overcome of my grant to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. That's not a physical eating at all. It's partaking. But in that sense, brothers and sisters, it means it's redemption so through the baptism of the Holy Ghost gives you the life of what that tree is. And if every child that would have conceived in this natural life would have been conceived from that tree, they wouldn't have been born again. They would have already been born with eternal life. But where's the tree of knowledge? It's in your mind. That's why we have x-ray theaters. Every time you pass one of them, take a good look. You're looking at a great big tree of knowledge. Just as sure as you're got freckles on your face. <laughs> And I have to say, when God lets write that article, I have never received a letter of rebuttal from it. It was an apostolic preacher 
missionary in South Africa a few years back. He wrote to me. He was getting the contender. He wrote to me and said these words, Brother Jackson, I would like for you to get certain booklets of Brother Bannum's concerns and send them to me. He says, I respect certain things. I can't believe that Eve has sex act with, with the devil. Well, she didn't. The devil told it was the devil using her serpent. Let's get it right. And he said, I like the contender, but I don't agree with everything the brother Adam said. So I thought, well, I'll just write him a letter. I said, now, brother, you took issue with Brother Branham and his teachings on the serpent. And so I give him the basic rundown as we put in the contender. I said, now, if you want, can you let me know? We'll take it from there on whether I send you any booklets or not. Well, I haven't heard from, from that day to this. I say that not to be smart or arrogant. But brothers and sisters, I'm thankful to God. He let me have a picture of some things. And I'm not afraid to stand before the wisest of them all. Now you give me a better picture. The natural garden that had all the fruit trees in it was from man's physical existence. But the two trees of good and evil and the tree of life, it says, they were in the midst of the garden. Didn't say a thing about coming out of the ground. That lets you know, brothers and sisters, they were symbols that stood in that little bit of heaven that was placed over that natural place. And that's why, brothers and sisters, it's hard to separate the spiritual side from the natural side. But when man sinned in that beautiful place, then God withdrew that. He lifted it, leaving man from that time of now to live in a world that has been absolutely infested with sin, all kinds of tricks and tactics of the devil. And the main thing that God had commissioned Adam and Eve to do, replenish the world, that's where the devil hit man. And that's why, brothers and sisters, man, man makes a lot of perversions and things. But, but the intimate, intimate life between man and woman is the thing that the devil has multiplied. Ruined him. And it's the thing that's ruining the human race. So tonight my point is this, brothers and sisters. We are living in now when we're going to learn the basics. We're going to learn some simple things that are really truth. But he is going to establish us and he's going to anger us. He's going to settle us. I hope, brothers and sisters, that whatever God has before us from now on, that mentally, spiritually, we'll be ready to take a good look at the things and realize, are we hearing the truth? Or are we just playing around some little thought that's not connected to anything that's important? I'm thankful tonight, brothers and sisters, for the things that God has taught me. Whatever that is, that's why you're a church here. It's in this area. God has established it. If there's any honor to receive, God, you bestow it upon the church because if it weren't for you, there would be no reason for me to stand here and through the years say these things. But you have become a means that lets me know God has a people. And I just want to share what God has been in my life with the people that they might benefit by. Because brothers and sisters, I cannot stand confusion. I don't want to live around it, and I'm sure you don't either. And God's not going to tolerate it. And as we get closer to the end, there's no doubt many things will come down the road that will try us. Yes, sometimes some of us might stumble over it. But let's take a good look at what we're seeing, what we're hearing, how we react to it. And I pray that we'll all learn to become as one. Because Paul over and over reminds us, you all speak the same thing. You all be of the same judgment. 
And I'm sure, brothers and sisters, we're on the right track if we just don't mess it up. Heavenly Father, tonight I pray. Lord, I've done my best to stand here and talk in human terms to explain how gracious and merciful you've been. I thank you, Lord, for my brothers and my sisters. It's a family, Lord. It's a joy to be together with a family of people that have the same taste, the same likeness, the things to communicate, the things to rejoice about. Because, Lord, we believe it is you that's brought us together that we might be a part of a body that eventually is scattered all over the world. Help us, Lord, that these words can grow in our lives to increase in us, Lord, the image and likeness of Jesus. That we may all walk down this pathway whatever time is left and the distance involved. That we can always speak consistently, Lord, of the things that you have taught us. Bless Brother Bud, Brother, Brother Allen. Help us all, Lord, to speak the same thing. I thank you for my brothers and sisters now, Lord. We commit it all to you in the blessed name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> For being so good to me When I was alone You took me in Your great family You gave me Hope said that I could live eternally. Now, with all my heart, I thank you, Lord. With all my heart and with all my soul, thank you. For Calvary and your riches untold. Thank you for heaven fair and the place you prepared me there. Now, with all my heart, I thank you, Lord. Amen. Just get some. I don't know where everybody knows Paul. He just grew up here ever since he was a little baby. He came to me out there today after the service was over, and he just called me off to the side, and he told me, he said, I really wanted to be baptized this morning. But he said, I just wanted to make sure that that, that would be all right, because he'd been baptized a few years back. But he just really feels there's a need in his life. He's been coming back to church now for a few weeks, and we're just thankful that God has spoke to him and done something in his life. So let's just hold him up before the throne of grace. Heavenly Father, we come before thy great throne tonight. You see Paul standing here tonight, Lord. You see the depths of his heart, Lord. You know exactly what he feels within himself. How, Lord, you have done something now to put a desire within any more to come to be baptized in that blessed name of our Savior. I pray tonight, Lord, as we would bury him in this watery grave. Lord, as he comes forth, may you take him and fill him with your spirit. God, may you guide his life. May you protect him and be with him. May you make, Lord, whatever changes are needful and necessary. May he feel your great presence upon him each day. Lord, I do pray when he would lay in his bed at night to sleep, may you just speak to him, Lord, to minister to him. Each morning, Lord, that he would awake. May he go before you in prayer. And may God you guide him down this journey of life now. We commit him, Lord, into thy hand. 
For we do ask it in Jesus Christ's name. And we thank you now. Amen. Amen. All right, Paul. All right, Paul, as it's recorded in Acts chapter 2, and verse 38, throughout the Scripture, I baptize you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for the remission of all of your sins. Amen. 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 Little one, I speak but my spirit to the thy soul, for I have seen thee in thy wayward ways of life. But I have looked upon thee in the days gone by. I speak these words to encourage thy heart. Put thy confidence in me, and for I say unto thee, thou wilt no more have disappointments and heartaches, but thou wilt have joy, and the beginning of a new way will open up before thee. And thy desire shall be unto me in the house of the Lord, and with those my people, saith the Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you for Calvary and your reaches untold. Oh, thank you for heaven found and the place you prepared me now with all my heart. I thank you. I 
I give you thanks. Oh, thanks, thanks, I give you thanks for all you have done. Oh, I am so glad my soul has found rest. Oh, Lord, I give you thanks. Oh, I give you thanks for all you have done. Oh, I am so blessed. My soul has found rest. Oh, Lord, I give you thanks. Oh, thanks, thanks. I give you thanks for all. All you have done, oh, I am so blessed. My soul has found rest, oh, Lord, I give you thanks. Oh, thanks, thanks, I give you thanks for all you have done, oh. I am so blessed, my soul has found rest, oh Lord, I give you thanks. Hallelujah. How the saints in the past held fast to God's promise with the faith to the test. Well, you know, they had hold of a powerful hand. Just in the midst of a storm, when they should have gone down, they found strength to stand. So let the flood waters roll, let the storm winds blow, let everything hell has tear in my soul. It may hinder me, bring me down on my knees, but that's as far as I'll go. Not a battle's been lost on that old rugged cross. I'm gonna reach heaven no matter the cost. The next mountain I climb, I just might find sweet heavens in view. These dark stormy days we're living the bound shake up time and again but the same grace he gave to them he's given to me and that same mighty hand that caused them to stand still gives victory so let the flood waters roll, let the storm winds blow, let everything hell has tear in my soul. It may hinder me, bring me down on my knees, but that's as far as I'll go. Not a battle's been lost on that old rugged cross. I'm going to reach heaven no matter the cost. The next mountain I climb, I just might find. Sweet heavens in view. So let the flood waters roll, let the storm winds blow, let everything hell has tear in my soul. It may 